On March 21st of 2005, a teenager drove into his high school, or Red Lake High, located in Minneapolis. He was dressed in combat boots and body armor, and what he was about to do was pure evil. This is the massacre of Red Lake. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also optical illusions. I'm not actually here, or am I? But anyway, today we're going over a pretty non-talked-about case involving an evil 16-year-old. I don't normally do this, but friend, we are at 99,200 subscribers at the time of making this video, and we only need 800 more until we reach 100,000. So if you want to subscribe, then that'd be rad. Jeffrey James Weiss, sometimes people have said it as Weiss, though I believe it is Weiss, was born on August 8th of 1988 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to his mother Joanne Weiss and his father Daryl Lushier Jr. His father was 23 or 21 years old at the time, and his mother was 17. This couple separated before Jeffrey was even born, and when he was born, Joanne's family made her give him up. So Jeffrey went with his father Daryl and his parents and extended family who lived in Red Lake, Minnesota. I'll get into exactly what Red Lake is soon, but Jeffrey lived with his father until he was about two years old, and this is when his mother Joanne took him back. They lived in Minneapolis, and it was said that Joanne was an alcoholic who was emotionally and sometimes physically. In June of 1993, Joanne was arrested and thrown into jail for driving while intoxicated. It's unclear where Jeffrey had went at this time. About a month later, on July 17th of 1993, Jeffrey's father, Daryl, married another woman. A few years would pass, and in the fall of 1996, Jeffrey and his mother moved to Shakopee, Minnesota, and Jeffrey was put into the third grade at Pearson Elementary School. His mother, a few years back in 1992, started dating a guy named Timothy Desjarlais. It was said that Timothy had been physically to Jeffrey, but it's not fully proven. Also in 1996, Jeffrey's half-sister, Daphne, was born, and then a year later, in 1997, his half-brother, Sebastian, was born. In 1997, Jeffrey was eight years old, and this year, a tragic event was going to happen that would really affect him. On Monday, July 21st of 1997, his father, Daryl Baby Dash Allen Lushier Jr. was 31 years old. Baby Dash, as he liked to go by, had worked as a manager at the Chupawa Trading Post and eventually became a logger. Now it's unclear as to exactly what happened, but on that Monday, Baby Dash had been in a standoff with the police on the Red Lake Reservation at his home. Now get this right, his father, Daryl Dash Lushier Sr., was a tribal police officer, and he was actually there during the standoff and tried to get his son to stand down. Baby Dash, or Jeffrey's father, took his own life in this standoff. Now things for Jeffrey were really going to be troubling and about to get a whole lot worse. About two years later, on March 5th of 1999, Jeffrey's mother Joanne was hanging out with her cousin. Once again, she was a very heavy drinker and would constantly leave Jeffrey home alone while she went out and drank. It's also said that apparently when she was drunk, she would hit Jeffrey with anything she could get her hands on and constantly tell him that he was a mistake and many other awful things. Supposedly, she'd lock him out of the house, and her husband or boyfriend Timothy locked Jeffrey in a closet one time and made him kneel for hours. But in March of that year, 
Joanne and her cousin were drinking and decided to take the car to go somewhere else. Joanne's cousin was the one driving, and she ended up striking a tractor trailer. The cousin would die at the scene while Joanne ended up living, but things were really bad for her. She suffered severe brain damage and a bunch of other injuries, and Joanne at this time was the one caring for Jeffrey. At this time, they lived together along with two of Jeffrey's aunts. Afterwards, though, Jeffrey would be sent to live with his grandparents, Daryl and Shelda, yet again in Red Lake. Jeffrey didn't want to go, but he really had no choice. He also lived with both of them, going back and forth between their houses, but I'm not sure when his grandparents became separated. Daryl, his grandfather, had actually gotten remarried to a woman about 20 years younger than him named Michelle Sagana. But the Red Lake Indian Reservation has over 400,000 acres of woods and wetlands. As of 2020, it has a population of around 5 to 6,000-ish people, and it's made up of a tribe called the Ojibwe people. Now, Red Lake is considered to be very sovereign, and for well over 200 years, the leaders of the tribe have basically eliminated all contact from the outside. Red Lake is one of the only reservations in the United States that's classified as closed, which means that no one except people of the tribe are allowed to own any land or live in the area. The Ojibwe people have their own police force, courts, and they handle all crime there except for murder and things of that nature. Now, Red Lake is an interesting place being that in 2004, there were over 3,500 court cases that were filed, which in an area of only 5,000 people is quite the amount. Around 40% of the tribe live below the poverty line with 60% of them being unemployed. A study was also done in 2004 that revealed a scary statistic. Apparently, 43% of freshman boys and 81% of freshman girls had contemplated taking their own lives, with 48% of the girls actually having tried it. Only 41% of students end up graduating, with many of them dropping out. And take everything I said with a grain of salt because I'm sure that Red Lake is nice, but I'm just stating facts and statistics. But this would end up being the place that Jeffrey went to live. Even though he lived here till about two to three, he probably didn't remember too much. Jeffrey was an outsider in Red Lake, and sometime around this time, he started to go by just his last name, Weiss. So from here on out, I'll now be referring to him as that. Weiss in Red Lake was not a happy person, and he hated being there. A close friend of his that he made there named Grant said that he wouldn't participate in powwows and avoided all traditional Indian activities. Weiss, by the eighth grade, had started to show signs that severe problems were happening. During this school year, he had bad grades and barely went to school for some reason, and he ended up failing. Because of this, Red Lake Middle School put him into a special program deemed the Learning Center. Apparently, this caused Weiss to get picked on very heavily. A woman named Mary said that after she went to pick up her grandchild from school, she saw people beating Weiss up or taunting him on six different occasions. Weiss, being an outcast, had started to turn to the internet to be his safe haven. Now, mind you, by high school, he was six foot three and about 300 pounds. Though, some sources say he was only six foot tall. And that's going to be a theme throughout this video. What information is correct and what isn't? due to newspapers and articles clashing with each other. But what is known is that Weiss was a very big guy and pretty intimidating. Most of his bullying came with words, not usually physical violence, though it is said that he got into a few fights. People would say things about how he doesn't have a mom and doesn't have a dad and other harsh things. But like I said though, Weiss turned to the internet to try and find friendship, and he, in his own words, said that he wanted to be a part of something. 
In 2003, he started to do a lot of things that pan into the next few years, and online, Weiss was pretty much everywhere. He had so, so many usernames, including a saying that he'll come to use later, or do you believe in God? He made an account on Newgrounds, a website where people can share their art. Basically, this includes games, music, etc. Now, Weiss's first account on there was called Psycho666, and in his description, it says, They call me Psych. I've got no life, and you're reading this, so I assume neither do you. It also says he lived in Hell, Minnesota. But Weiss created two games, one called The Hitman, and the other was called Pigeon Hunter. Both of them were pretty graphic flash shooting games. To give credit where it's due, Weiss was a very talented person who was pretty beyond his years articulately. You'll see that soon. But also, it's very clear as well that he had a dark mind that was only getting darker. Still in 2003, Weiss's maternal grandmother died, but it's unknown as to how close they were. Also, some sources say that she was still alive and never died, so that one's a bit iffy. Also, I just want to say that Weiss this year, or maybe the year prior or the year before that, had really started to get into history. This particular history was uh, very German related, if you get my gist, and Weiss had basically become obsessed with it. We'll get further into that shortly. In late December of 2023, specifically December 21st, Weiss posted on a forum called Above Top Secret, which to sum it up is basically a place for conspiracy theories. Weiss posted on here quite a lot, and what he says is certainly telling. I'll read through a good amount of posts on here and other websites to give you a great understanding. Weiss's first post on the Above Top Secret forum said, Hello all, I'm new here. I'm not exactly sure what this post is about, but hopefully by the end of it, what it's about will be clear. Lately, I've been having some really strange dreams, and they seem very realistic and filled with colors and sounds. They really are more realistic than dreams from like last month, but a few nights ago, I had this dream where I saw this very evil, very creepy canine's face coming towards me, and I heard someone say, shoot. Either way, everything went black, and I could feel my whole body jerking and shaking, and while this was happening, I could hear very loud and very distinct gunshots, mostly machine gunfire. I found it very weird and woke up immediately after feeling a little disoriented. I don't know what's up, but anyone have any idea why this kind of stuff is just happening now? I hope I posted this in the right forum. Weiss was also a talented writer and had been posting on a website called Homepage of the Dead and they discussed zombies. Weiss had been a member on this site for a pretty long time and had racked up a good amount of friends there. In December of 2003, still, Homepage of the Dead was shut down and so the people on there got together on a different site called The Writer's Coven. But Weiss posted a story here titled Surviving the Dead on December 24th and it starts off with what looks to be a school shooting, but it's actually zombies that are coming to kill everyone. The story was placed in a town called Grover's Mill, which was from Orson Welles' book, War of the Worlds. It's the landing site where aliens landed. The story had a guy in it named Max and his best friend Morticia, and followed them around while they got away from zombies. In it, they met an SS officer who apparently came with a bunch of other soldiers to kill everyone that's a zombie and to save everyone else. But anyway, also in either very, very late December of 2003 or early January of 2004, Weiss was with his friend Mac at a basketball game. To give you a brief description of exactly how Weiss looked and was and what he liked at this point, he started to put his hair into devil horns. He wore combat boots, black pants with chains, and usually he would sport a trench coat. Now, according to Weiss in a post he made on May 13th of 2004, his friend Mac, who happens to wear a black trench coat like he does, did a 
during the national anthem to try and get shock value. This pegged the group or the two boys as the trench coat mafia. I'll get into that post in a second, but Weiss also liked music like Cradle of Filth and Corn and rap music in the genre of horrorcore. He also liked Nirvana and a bunch of other bands. His music choice was pretty vast. In some posts, you can find how he hated rap and how he felt like it changed the Red Lake in a very negative way. But horrorcore, the rap that he liked, to sum it up, is a genre of rap that usually has themes of death, violence, and evil things. Weiss, on March 19th of 2004, had officially signed up and started posting on he went under the username Todesengel, sorry if I butchered that, which is German for Angel of Death. On this post, he replied to a few people and said that he was a Native American, which is a bit bizarre considering the history, but on here Weiss had stated two things. One is a bit eerie, and the other corroborates what we said earlier about him getting into fights. Weiss stated that you encounter a lot of hostility when you claim to be a national but because of my size and appearance, people don't give me as much trouble as they would if I looked weak. I already had a fist fight with a c not too long ago over me being what I am. I also won. Weiss also said in this same post that once he commits himself to something, he stays until the end. Now going back to Weiss's posts on Above Top Secret, he really posted a lot about different topics, a lot of random stories about Bigfoot or Native American legends, talk about a certain German leader and things related to Germany, and other relatively interesting things such as aliens. Well, on May 13th of 2004, a user named Dark Helmet on Above Top Secret posted this. School scare. I just heard on our local news that a student at my high school was suspended indefinitely after police found a hit list of over 100 students at my school. I can't help but worry if my name was on there because I'm one of the more popular guys and they tend to be the most common on lists like that. I've never picked on anyone so I don't have too much to worry about but who knows. I only live like two hours from Columbine, and good thing they stopped this or we could have had another. I'm not sure who the kid was, but I'm sure I'll find out soon." And Weiss replied by saying, "...they pegged me as a possible school shooter earlier this year, or wait, that was last month. Apparently someone was supposed to shoot up the school on 420, and there was a lot of buzz around me, and for good reasons, I guess. I wear combat boots with my pant legs tucked into them, wear a trench coat, and at the last basketball game, my friend Mac, who happens to wear a black trench coat like mine, did us during the national anthem for shock value, so they had us pegged as trench coat mafia. My friend Rose even said that I fit the profile of a school shooter that she saw on 60 Minutes. They also pinned it on me because 420 happens to be birthday, and I seem to be the only one who promotes national beliefs, not the stereotypical white BS you hear racists shouting either, so it's not hard to label a school shooter. I happen to be not so popular, gothic, in the sense that I wear nothing but black, spike my hair in devil horns, and listen to music like Cradle of Filth and Corn, and happen to be an emotionally disturbed person, if you could call me that. So it's really no problem slapping a label on someone because they fit the stereotype. And no, I wasn't the one who did the threat. On game day, 420, the feds were all around the place watching. Cop cars in nearly every corner around the school and a few large unmarked black vans sitting around. I bet they were on standby, so they were prepared for something to happen. P.S. I'm not a white can't even spell it. I'm a Native American, Ojibwa, living on the Red Lake Indian Reservation in Minnesota. And let's not have this turn into a hardcore political discussion about my political ideals, okay? Not long after this, Weiss stated that he was cleared of being the culprit who called in the threat, 
but things were really about to become even worse. In June of 2004, Weiss tried to take his life again, and with his grandparents' help, they took him to seek medical treatment at the Thief River Mental Health Clinic. While here, Weiss was prescribed, I believe, 40 milligrams of Prozac a day, 20 milligrams in the morning, and 20 milligrams at night. Weiss was also at the facility for three days straight. But to go back to his online presence, he started another Newgrounds account on August 5th of 2004, but this time it was going to be for his Flash animations. His username that he went by this time was Regret, and this is his bio. On October 2nd of 2004, Weiss posted his first animation, and this one was titled Target Practice. I believe it's a bit too graphic to show, but it depicts a guy smoking and then he just started shooting a bunch of people. On this video, there's a pretty interesting comment. We and Fan157 said, Watching pretty good flash. Main guy kills himself. Ween fan 157. Ha stupid cake. Damn race. What? Did that guy just kill him? We join our here already in progress. Good. And if you gripe at me for putting a zero on violence, then you can just blame the media. Weiss replied back, Random violence, a serial mass murderer, and people who blame the media afterwards. Yup, must be the 21st century. God bless America. A bit eerie considering the fact, but Weiss also made another animation, and this one was titled Clown. It was posted on October 28th. This one I can show you. Definitely very creepy. Once again, though, it, to give credit where it's due, it was pretty good for the time considering the fact that it was 2005. But there's a very interesting comment on this post as well. Someone named Nixus6 replied, Different. I don't know who you are or why you made this flash, but you should seek help. Whoever this person is was absolutely correct in their judgment. Weiss did need to seek help. More help. Going back to his postings on ATS, because after he had gotten out of the mental health facility, he kept posting. On August 16th of 2004, Weiss mentions a 22 caliber rifle and says that it's a common round and that it's a good weapon. This will come into play a little later. On Weiss's ATS account, he posted a lot about politics as well, and reading through his posts, you'd probably think he was a lot older, as it doesn't sound like a 16-year-old. He was mentioning some very interesting things, and even things that still pertain to this day. On November 5th of 2004, another ATS member made a thread called Real Life Daydream. In it, they ask, have you ever had those days that it just feels like you're in a dream? I would like to know if anyone from ATS knows what I'm talking about. Weiss replied, The only time this ever happened to me was when I was in a seriously messed up mental state. It felt like I was detached from reality and that everything was fake, like it was all a dream that I knew I'd wake up from. Sad thing is I didn't. Nevertheless, I've experienced something similar, even if it was due to mental instability. This same day, he replied to another thread of a band member saying Mount Etna spewing ash and saying the dust over the Mediterranean is quite thick today. I don't believe we have anything like this hanging over Mount St. Helens or Yellowstone. I guess we can be thankful for something. Weiss replied by saying, I feel like a child in the middle of a dark abyss right now. All things scary and deadly could bite me from all directions each scenario more dangerous than the next. The world seems very chaotic, but I guess this is the way it's always been. 
I think life is the best soap opera there is. And the best part is the producers are about to bust out their most entertaining plot lines. A few days would go by and on November 8th of 2004, Weiss made a very interesting post about seeing an owl. Stay tuned for a very interesting but bizarre thing that happened involving what Weiss is about to talk about. He wrote, I wasn't sure what forum to post this in because it confuses me a lot and has me wondering, but I'll take a guess and post it here in the paranormal forum. A few months ago, when I was on my way back from the Thief River Mental Health Clinic after a th attempt, I saw something that I thought was severely out of place. It was an owl sitting in the plain sight in the brush near the road. I saw him or her clearly, and to boot it was white, a white owl in the middle of the day sitting next to the road. I didn't think too much about it till about two months later I asked my grandmother about it. She told me the story that scared the sheesh out of me. She said one time when her and a friend were on their way from somewhere, I forgot since it's not really that important of a detail, her friend saw an owl in the middle of the day during their drive. They were on their way to the casino. She said her friend mentioned the owl to her, but neither paid any attention to it. They were sitting in the casino playing their favorite game when my grandmother's friend, same one who had witnessed the owl, fell to the ground. She had a heart attack. Long story short, she didn't make it. Period. Now when I heard this, I must have looked like a carton of milk. I was so white from fear. That was the only experience I ever had with an owl being seen during the day, she said. I always heard seeing an owl during daytime was an omen of some sort since owls are a night bird. But doing some research on the net, I didn't find out what exactly they are an omen for, but rather that they have always, for the most part, been associated with evil forces. Now I posted this here to hopefully gain some insight from the more spiritually affluent peoples of the board. I want to know, am I screwed? What does the omen mean? And should I be worried? Any help would be greatly appreciated, as I'm still worried over this whole thing. Any help would be greatly appreciated. It's very clear that Weiss was trying to reach out for help. But another user by the name of Super Dude replied back and said, Well, you did try to commit s as I read it. Sounds like you're pretty much screwed, lol. Weiss replied and said, Would you please try to be a little bit more considerate? I had went through a lot of things in my life that had driven me to a darker path than most choose to take. Here he talks about trying to take his life in a very graphic manner, and he said, I had the revelation that this was not the path. It was my decision to seek medical treatment as on the other hand I could have, here he talks about that same thing again and says, I am now on antidepressants and just because you've probably never been through anything like I have doesn't give you the right to say what you have. I'm trying to turn my life around. I'm trying really hard. The attitudes of people like you are what set me back. Super Dude did end up apologizing by saying, Sorry, I didn't mean to be insulting. Unfortunately, a failed attempt at humor. And Weiss then replied, Uh, no problem. I would try to be a little bit more easy about it all, except it's hard to be humorous about the things I've been through. No worries though, man. Water under the bridge. One last comment that Weiss made on this post was to a user named DeCruz, and he said, I'm getting over much of the problems I've had in the past, DeCruz. The only reason I'm so worried about this whole thing is it seems to be rooted in truth. If a white owl is a bad omen, then I'd rather be prepared than unprepared. Now Weiss did keep posting on ATS until March 6th of 2005. The rest of his posts, and there weren't many of them, were about politics, Bigfoot, sinning, and other random things. Nothing on here really alluded to anything. Another thing that's worth mentioning though is that in May of 2004, Weiss's mother Joanne and her husband Timothy filed for a divorce. They separated a few years prior in like 2001 though. Joanne had actually started to recover around this time and so her and Timothy discussed how they were going to raise their two children. Weiss was never mentioned though. Apparently Joanne essentially a abandoned him. 
Also, the 2004 to 2005 school year for Weiss or his 10th grade year, I believe. Some sources say he was an 11th grader, but for some reason he was in and out of school. It's not that he wasn't going, but he was actually on a homeschool program, but also sometimes he would go to school. I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but the reasoning for this is very vast. After looking at several old newspapers, they listed many reasons. Jeffrey's grandmother said that he was depressed and unable to learn. Some say teachers recommended it. Some say it was because of disciplinary action. Whatever the reason may be is besides the point. It's just the fact that it happened. But in late December of 2004, Weiss started posting on something called a live journal. He made the account a year prior in 2003 on December 24th. This account and website was kind of like a Twitter almost, where you could just post your thoughts. Weiss's account title was Thoughts of a Dreamer, and it says to liberate your mind. His bio states that I'm nothing but your average Native American stone. I'm mellow half the time, mostly natural, but mostly induced as well. I'm not a junk or an alcoholic. MJ is my gal of choice. Enough about that, though. I don't know why you're reading this anyway. I'm gonna roll this, sh so I'll see you later. His interests were classic rock, hippie era mentality, history, Mary Jane, some other stuff, and world wars. On December 14th of 2004, Weiss posted for the first time and said, out with the old and in with the new. As I sit here typing up my musings, I listen to Cheech and Chong up in smoke, the movie occasionally shifting my eyes from screen to screen, trying to balance out typing and observing. This is my new journal in which I will put my thoughts down to words, my view on the day's past events and whatnot, my two cents on the world in general. This is my new introductory post, all the spellings and grammatical errors area two by products of the new me. Blah. That sounds so egotistical. While you're here, you might as well check out the message board for the band I'm in. Ciao. Current mood, accomplished. Current music, Johnny Cash, when the man comes around. So to touch on Weiss's band, I couldn't find any information besides the fact that the band's name was 666. No idea who was in it or if they ever made a song. But Weiss on this post appeared to be in good spirits. That immediately changes in the next one that came on January 4th of 2005. Weiss wrote, The instrument of my resurrection was supposed to be freedom. There isn't an open sky or endless field to be found where I reside, nor is there light or salvation to be discovered. Right about now, I feel as low as I ever have. I don't think it's a big secret why, really. My biggest disappointment and downfall came from what was supposed to be the one thing to lift me from the grave. I'm continually digging for myself. Nah, never. Only the worthy are saved, you know? I don't know, but what I do know is I'm a ret forever believing things would change for me. I'm starting to regret sticking around. I should have taken the Razor Blade Express last time around. Well, whatever, man. Maybe they've got another shuttle coming around sometime soon. Ciao. Current mood, drained, drained. Current music, Strawberry Fields Forever, John Lennon. Obviously, the tone of this post changes severely with Weiss saying that he should have gone through with his attempt and that right now he feels as low as he ever has. I'm not entirely sure what he's referencing in this post with his biggest disappointment. But his last post on Live Journal came on January 27th of 2005, and he wrote, So f naive, man. So f naive. Always expecting change when I know nothing ever changes. I've seen mothers choose their man over their own flesh and blood. I've seen others choose alcohol over friendship. I sacrifice no more for others. Part of me has f died, and I hate this sh I'm living every man's nightmare, and that single fact alone is kicking my I really must be f worthless. This place never changes, 
and never will f it all. Now, obviously, from the past two posts, you can tell that his mindset was very bad and evil thoughts were starting to severely cloud his judgment. About a month or so would pass, and on February 21st of 2005, Weiss went back to his therapist or doctor. I believe it's because his grandmother or grandfather had thought that he was depressed. So the doctor ended up upping his dose of Prozac from 40 milligrams to 60 milligrams a day. About two weeks later, on March 4th, Weiss and his friend Sky and a few other friends had watched a movie titled Elephant. It came out in 2003 and is kind of based on Columbine as it's a movie about a school shooting. Well, apparently, Weiss was the one who brought the movie, and Sky said that Weiss skipped ahead to the parts that showed the students planning and then doing the shooting. The friends all talked about the movie afterwards, but no one had thought Weiss said anything that made it seem like he was going to do something. Sky said that Weiss seemed very normal and that them watching movies like this was a pretty typical thing of them to do. After watching this movie, though, it appears as if Weiss had become obsessed or something. He had an MSN account, and his name on there was Solitude. Weiss decided to change his profile picture to a still image of the elephant movie where the two boys are about to walk into the school. He also changed a few other key things about his profile that very much so allude to the fact that something is about to happen. His location says, Endless Scrutiny, Minnesota, United States. Underneath, it says, Occupation, Doormat. His interests were military, high schools, and death and dying. A little about him was that he had 16 years of accumulated rage suppressed by nothing more than brief glimpses of hope, which have all but faded to black, that he can feel the urges within slipping through the cracks the leash that he can no longer hold. Weiss's favorite things now were moments where control becomes completely unattainable, times when maddened psychopaths briefly open the gates to hell and let the chaos flood through. Those few individuals who care enough to reclaim their place. His hobbies and interests were planning, waiting, and hating. Now what happened between about March 5th to March 20th isn't really talked about or known. It's obvious that things got worse and worse for Weiss, but he kind of laid low on the internet and he wasn't at school during this period of time. I'm going to take his hobbies and interests into account here and guess for those few weeks that he had been planning. Planning for what exactly? Well, that was pure evil. On March 21st of 2005 in Red Lake, it was a pretty cold day. Now this part's a bit confusing because like I said earlier, Weiss kind of bounced around his grandparents' homes. In certain articles, it states that he lived with Shelda, his grandmother. In others, it states that he lived with Daryl, his grandfather, and Daryl's wife and their child. There's also an article stating that Weiss was actually at Shelda's home this day, and she saw him eating a sandwich around 12 p.m. Apparently, he told an aunt he lived with at his grandmother's that he was going for a walk and left the house sometime at about 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. He would then go to his grandfather's or Daryl's home. Daryl's home was just a walk through the woods, and so it wouldn't take very long to get there. On this day, Weiss was wearing black anarchic boots, black menace jeans. He had a pair of white socks on, a black shirt on, a black sweatshirt on, and a hand towel with a disposable lighter. He also had some sort of bandana covering his face. Now one thing I didn't mention that Weiss had with him while walking over to his grandfather's was a Ruger Mark II 22 caliber pistol. As to where exactly he got this weapon from, it's not exactly known. In the FBI documents released, there was one name that was a suspect of possibly owning the gun, but they redacted that information. Apparently, Weiss had been in possession of this gun for about a year or so, and so his early post about carrying a 22 pistol with him now 
makes a bit more sense. But anyway, this is where things become evil. Weiss walked into his grandfather's home with a plan. His first step was to go into his grandfather Daryl's bedroom to confront him. While Weiss went into Daryl's room and Daryl was asleep, so he pulled out the 22 caliber pistol and then shot his grandfather over 10 times. Somehow, his wife or girlfriend, some articles say both, Michelle didn't hear these gunshots. She was walking up the stairs with a basket of laundry in her hands when Weiss shot her in the head one time with a 22 caliber pistol. After this happened, Weiss then got even more prepared. He decided to grab his grandfather's 40 caliber Glock service pistol. If you remember, Daryl was a police officer. He grabbed a 12 gauge Remington shotgun, a police duty belt, a radio, and also a ballistic vest. Weiss also attempted to take either an M4 or an M4 style 223 rifle, but the rifle was apparently too dirty, and so while trying to put ammunition in it, it jammed. Weiss was dressed like he was going to war. Now, after he had assembled everything together, he went back up to Michelle and shot her again, this time with a 40 caliber Glock. Weiss, then at around 2.40 p.m. ish, stole Daryl's 4x4 police cruiser and made his way to Red Lake High. At about 2.46 to 2.48 p.m., Weiss crashed the police cruiser into the front of the building. Next, he supposedly fired two shotgun shots into the air and then tried walking into the school. Right inside, before you can even get into the actual school part, you have to go through a metal detector with two guards at the post. Apparently, sometime in 1995 to 1997, there was some sort of gang shooting that happened in the school, but I couldn't find a single bit of information about it. There were four doors that were at the front of the building, and three of the four doors were locked. The guards had seen Weiss trying to get inside, and could clearly see that he had weapons on him. Now, these security guards just so happened to not have bulletproof vests on, but also they didn't have weapons themselves. These guards were named Derek Brunn and Leanne Grant. After Leanne saw Weiss trying to open the doors, she got up and told Derek that he needs to run, but he didn't. He stayed. Leanne started to run away. Weiss eventually found the door that was unlocked, and as he walked inside, he fired another shot, but this one went into the ceiling. Derek had immediately recognized Weiss. Meanwhile, as Leanne is running away, she saw some of the students were running to the front of the school to see what the noise was, and so she ran over to tell them to get out of there. Leanne at this point could see that Derek was still sitting down at their post. Leanne started to scream at the kids, run, there's a guy with a gun here, just run. She then radioed in to someone and said, there's a guy coming in the school and he's shooting and he has a gun. Leanne then turned around and could see that Derek was still at the post, but this time he began to get up and head towards Weiss. As she and some students were running down the hallway, they immediately heard two more shots and those are the ones that killed Derek. Weiss was just getting started, however, and began to chase them when he took a turn down a different hallway. A teacher named Neva Rogers was pushing a computer cart and talking to some students in the hallway and they came into contact with Weiss. Immediately, everyone started running and some reports here say that Neva was actually shot while in the hallway for the first time, but I'm unsure of that. But they all ran and knocked on another teacher named Missy Dodd's room. Missy let them all inside and they turned the lights off, locked the door, and got everyone under the tables. Weiss had seen them go inside of this room and so he tried to get inside and realized the door was locked. He then shot out the glass panel and reached his arm through to unlock the door. Inside of this classroom, there were a total of 15 students and 3 adults. Neva Rogers, one of the teachers, began praying to God and said, God be with us. And Weiss did not like this, so he walked up to her with a shotgun, pulled the trigger, but it didn't fire. He then pulled out the pistol 
and shot her four total times. Now he began to ask a very infamous question to people he was going to shoot, and that was, do you believe in God? Long story short, this was basically a quote from Eric Harris of Columbine and one of their victims named Rachel Scott. But Weiss, after shooting and killing Neva, said to the classroom, if any of you believe in God, now would be a good time to call in a favor. He then decided to approach a group of students and he asked them, do you guys believe in God? One of the students said no and his life actually got spared. The rest of the group didn't reply to Weiss, and they were all shot at. This is when Jeffrey May, a 16-year-old sophomore at Rudd Lake, had intervened. He tried to wrestle Weiss to take him down and managed to stab him in the stomach with a pencil. Because of this, a bunch of students were able to flee the classroom, but unfortunately Jeffrey would be shot three times, twice in the neck and once in the jaw. Jeffrey ended up surviving, but his life was changed forever. At this point, Weiss had killed three students in the classroom, one teacher, and he injured five students. He then left the classroom and wandered around the halls and entered another classroom where he shot two more students. Weiss continued asking people if they believed in God, and if they said yes or hesitated to answer, he would shoot them. At about 2.52 p.m., only moments after this tragedy happened, Weiss had went back to the main entrance where he shot two more students. Around then is when police had arrived after receiving several calls and they quickly went inside. A police officer with a 223 rifle had gotten into a firefight with Weiss for about four minutes or so and Weiss ended up getting shot in the lower back, the right leg, and the right arm. Weiss then ran back to the classroom where he killed a few people and yelled to the police officer that he has hostages. Next, Weiss shot and killed two more students who were hiding underneath the tables. At this point, he knew everything was up and that he was caught. So in one final instance, he leaned up against a wall, grabbed the shotgun he brought, and that was the end of Jeffrey Weiss's day of terror. After nine total minutes, seven people inside of the school, not including Weiss, were now dead. Seven others were injured, and a whole entire reservation was shocked. There were many questions asked and many answers given. I'm now about to dive into some things that are interesting that happened after this occurrence. Earlier, I mentioned a post from Jeff about seeing a white owl after an attempt of taking his own life. Now what's weird about this is that there was a speaker named Michael Dahl who just so happened to be at the school on this day. Michael was a motivational speaker who taught students about his cultural beliefs and past hardships to show students how to live better and steer clear of hopelessness. Michael, on March 21st of 2005, was at the school and started telling students in a classroom to avoid alcohol. As he finished his speech, he heard gunshots, but to him it sounded like someone was throwing a fit and punching lockers. Just a tidbit about that information, there was a lot of other people who said a similar thing, that the gunshots sounded like people banging on the lockers. But Michael decided to move closer to the door so he could see out the window of it. This is when Weiss walked right by the classroom and looked inside. Apparently, he looked right at Michael, and Michael looked back at him and smiled and nodded his head. Michael said that Weiss didn't even notice him or anyone in the class somehow. Michael said he thinks Weiss probably couldn't see inside because he walked by the classroom again a bit later and did the same thing. Now, the most interesting thing that Michael said is that after arriving to Red Lake High, the first thing that Michael saw was an owl. To some native tribes, including the one Weiss was a part of, believing that seeing that bird is a sign that death is close by. Michael said to this owl, don't you bother me, don't you be calling my name, don't you be calling my family's name, leave us alone. I don't mean to disrespect you, what you may bring, but I don't want to hear you. 
very eerie that he just so happened to see an owl this exact same day, considering the fact of what Weiss wrote about. Also, there's basically zero way that Michael would have known what Weiss wrote about, considering Michael said what he did in July of that year. Michael also has since been arrested twice, I believe, once for animal cruelty and the other for disgusting reasons involving children. And if it's the same person, though, it could not be, but it's a guy with the same name from the same area. Another very interesting thing pertaining to this case is that there were about 39 people who said something about them knowing about Weiss wanting to commit a school shooting. There were also a few people who were apparently co-conspirators involved in this entire elaborate plot. A guy named Floyd Jourdain, who was the Red Lake tribal chairman at the time, had a son named Louis Flordain. Now, I believe that Lewis and Weiss were very good friends and also distant cousins. A week after Weiss did what he did, Lewis was arrested at 17 years old for conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit offenses against the United States, and also threatening interstate communications. Now, I'm not exactly sure what was said between these two, but there were thousands of emails sent back and forth that we can assume we're talking about committing a mass shooting and other random threatening things. These emails were never made public, and so a lot of it is up for speculation. Also, Lewis said that him and Weiss stopped talking a few weeks before when he confronted him. Lewis said that he told Weiss that the way he's thinking is not right. Also, that he intentionally distanced himself from Weiss and that at that point, they were not on speaking terms. Another thing that supposedly happened is that during the time of the shooting, Lewis was in the school's library. He didn't listen to a teacher when they told the class to stay put and he ran into the hallway. This is where he apparently confronted Weiss for acting without him. Lewis would end up pleading guilty to threatening interstate communications, a felony, and a plea deal in order to get rid of the other two charges, so he did. Again, during the aftermath, the FBI went to Weiss's home and discovered a lot of things. On March 29th of 2005, one of his family members gave the FBI a copy of a map of the school. The map was a copy of the one that was found in the RLHS student handbook. Drawn on this map were a few very telling things. This included sniping locations, a kill zone, which was the gymnasium, and POT spots, which authorities believe stood for a path of travel. It's very clear that Weiss had been planning for quite some time, and that plan most definitely included multiple people. Authorities also found a drawing in one of Weiss's journals that depicts a character that looks similar to himself committing a school shooting. It showed him holding a shotgun, an AR-15, and him wearing a law enforcement duty belt. Basically everything that Weiss had taken from his grandfather, with the exception of the AR because it jammed. The background of this photo was also a pretty accurate drawing of the entrance to Red Lake High School, including the metal detectors, front door, the desk of the security guards, and I believe even the security guards. But another thing to note is that as of now, almost 20 years later, we still have zero idea about who the other co-conspirators were. We have zero idea on how Weiss managed to get his hands on the initial weapon, and we still truly don't know what happened that day to set him off or why he chose March 21st. I read in one article that it was one of his cousin's birthdays, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, I read that Weiss, according to two unnamed people, wanted to attack the high school on a day where he knew it would be crowded, such as prom or the first day of school, and apparently he did want to do it on April 20th or the anniversary of Columbine. Weiss was trying to recruit people to help him, and no one, not even those people, know why he did it this day. So that will most likely forever remain a mystery. But regardless, there was nothing that warranted doing what he did. 
Weiss had a hard life, as you've seen. However, that doesn't give him the right to murder nine innocent people. Daryl Dash Wushier Sr. was 58 years old and Weiss's grandfather. He was a lifelong tribal police officer who went by his nickname Dash. Dash was considered to be a great guy and everyone knew him and liked him. He had five adult children, one had died before him, and also two children that were under the age of 10 at the time. Daryl's girlfriend, Michelle, was 32 years old, and she was a cashier at a nearby casino. She loved her family, that included Daryl and their son they had together. It's unclear where their son was on that tragic day, but thankfully, he wasn't injured. Derek Brunn was 28 years old and remembered as a gentle spirit who loved everyone he came into contact with. He was a former graduate from Red Lake High School and also a former police officer. In 2005, he was taking classes to become an emergency medical technician. Derek was seen as an all-around good guy and the type of person to open his home to someone who needed to stay. Derek was a kind and gentle person that had just started working at the school a few months prior in the fall. Derek was divorced at the time and had one child, a daughter, but she had died a few years before Derek at the age of two and a half. His family said that the only comfort they had was that he was now with his daughter. Alicia White was 15 years old and was considered to be a girl who had many friends and one who was a lot of fun. Alicia was a sweet girl who never hurt anybody, never had anything bad to say about anything or anyone. Alicia was the oldest of six children, and they all lived with their ill grandmother. Alicia was on the high school basketball team, she was a part of a local community church youth group, and she also helped to raise her siblings. Neva Jane Rogers was 62 years old and an English teacher at Red Lake High. Several years before 2005, she left her job as a teacher at Red Lake High, but then six years before 2005, she came back. Neva was the advisor of the yearbook and the student newspaper, where she'd help students prepare sports reports and other things. In 2005, she was getting ready to go to Alaska, but unfortunately, she never got that opportunity. Neva felt like she was needed at Red Lake because of the poverty levels and truancy of students. Neva had a soft spot for children who lost their parents or had become parents young themselves, and she wanted to help them. Neva was a great person. Thurlene Marie Stillday was 15 years old. She loved to tell stories and always had something to talk about. Thurlene had a ton of friends and was happy all of the time, and she loved snowmobiling. She was one of four siblings and really looked forward to life. Chanel Rosebear was 15 years old and she was tall, a cheerleader, and she played basketball. Chanel was attending an Indian boarding school in Oklahoma, but she begged her mother to go back home and she let her. Chanel loved smiling and her family and just life in general. Chase Lushier was 15 years old and was a basketball player at the high school. Chase had also just recently, at a very young age, become a father, and he was trying hard to balance everything. He did love his son, though. Chase is looked at as a hero because he pushed a girl out of the way before he was shot. He's remembered for his bravery and great sense of humor, and I don't believe that he was related to Weiss in any way, even though him and Weiss's grandfather shared the same last name. Dwayne Lewis was 15 years old and a basketball player. He played at the school, at the local gym, and basically anywhere he really could. Not too much information on him is out there, but we do know that he was best friends with Jeffrey May and actually got Jeffrey into basketball. Jeffrey May was one of the people that was shot while trying to save other students. He was the one who attacked Weiss after seeing him shoot a girl named Alicia and his friend Dwayne, and he stabbed him with a pencil. Well, when he did that, it was exactly during the time when Weiss went to shoot Missy Dodds, another teacher, in the head, but he pulled the trigger and there was no round in the chamber. Jeff rushed Weiss as he was reloading, Unfortunately, he was shot three times, but he managed to stay alive. Jeff suffered a stroke and a bunch of other issues with his body, including paralysis. 
A few years later, he was awarded $750,000 for his bravery. He's a hero and deserves to be looked at and treated as one. Jeff saved his teacher's life and countless other students' lives as well, putting himself directly in the crossfire. I just want to say rest in peace to everyone who was taken in this senseless event, and I hope they're all resting peacefully and that those who were injured have been able to find some peace. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please like and subscribe because it's all we do. I also have an all-exclusive Patreon if you're interested in that. There's a bunch of tiers to choose from, and the third one allows for you to see a Patreon-only video, and that tier and the second one allow you to have your name at the end of each High Time Crime video. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.